to be able to take away a better understanding of language workshop. And I know there's been a lot of talk about what language workshop is and what it isn't, but Ms. Tash challenged us in an email not too long ago about what is close analytical reading. So we're going to look at today a little bit of background knowledge before we go into the actual lesson. And the lesson hopefully is going to be between 20 and 30 minutes long because that's our time for language workshop. But this is what close analytical reading is. It's examining a text for meaning. It's reading and rereading deliberately. It's really empowering the students to understand those central ideas and key supporting details, reflecting on meanings of words, understanding the text of a whole, and comprehending the central idea, message, theme, moral, or a nonfiction text for information. Students have a really hard time with the last one unless you do an explicit teach. And that's what Language Workshop is about. It's looking at what we feel like are those good exemplar texts and finding those opportunities to do some close analytical reading so we can teach our students the structure of the book along with how to flesh out those deeper meanings, even at the inference level. Lots of reading comes from taking what is in the text and being able to cite it, saying this is in the text, and because that's in the text, I infer. And the more complex the text, the more you do deeper level inferential thinking. So those are the opportunities that Language Workshop provides for us. And um, Dorn and Sophus remind us that we can't go on without giving kids those opportunities to reflect, to be analytical about the text, and to discuss it. That's why in Common Core it's so important that we have those opportunities for speaking and listening and engaging with the complex text. And everybody needs to have those opportunities. Um, we have the structure, which is our workshop structure. And so language workshop, 20 to 30 minute lessons, it can be whole group, this is the biggie. It's grade level or above grade level text. That's the focus. Reading workshop starts with a mini lesson, as does writer's workshop. But the difference here with reading workshop, it's on instructional level text or grade level. Above grade level text is the key. And that's where we're looking to build those, that um, deeper understanding with the complex text. How do we do it? How do we bridge that gap between kids being able to understand those texts independently? We do it by scaffolding. So we're going to talk a little bit about scaffolding today too. But it look, this is the puzzle piece. We have to look at reading and scaffolding complex texts because remember, those are texts that are above grade level that they'll be able to comprehend. They just can't read it by themselves. So we have to be able to ask those questions, to get them through, to predict, to infer what the author means. And we do that by whole group. But let's say we have some kids that can read that text already independently we can break it down into small groups. We can do some independent reading where kids are listening to those complex texts. These are either by the playaways that are provided by the library or passages that we've taped for them to listen so that we can, when we pull them in our small group, they're ready to analyze those um, with us as our, as our gui we're guiding them. Writing about the reading, they have to be able to go into and cite um, evidence from the text, but all, actually it depends on if they're writing their opinion or a narrative or answering a question. So we have to be able to look at the structure here because an opinion writing looks different than um, the narrative or a summary of the text. And then don't forget share time, and share time is really quickly forgotten because our time is, is usually eaten up with how we, um, we do all the other teaching. But this is important, especially for our kids 
who need to hear the thinking and the processes that kids who can understand this text with less scaffolding, they need to be hearing those kids share out what their thinking is because it lifts their thinking of the text. So it's all about looking at language and um, I think I skipped this slide. Hang on, let me go back. Oh, it's not in there. You know, well, we'll talk about that later. But anyway, when we look at this um, language workshop, what we really want to do is think about why we select those texts we do. And I know we all have this book, and it's really good about helping us select, men a select mentor text. And since I cited them um, a quote, I'm going to read it to you. Eamon and Gayer, the authors of the book, said, the bottom line for selecting a text is seeing something in how that text is written, and which would be useful for students to see, something that holds potential for their learning, and something that will add to their knowledge base. So we're constantly thinking about what books we're going to select because they are exemplar text. They're, they help us understand why the author wrote the book, and we can sort that out with the students. So, during language workshop, we can do any of these things. It's not limited to one thing. That's the beauty of language workshop. It's our catalyst for going into reading and writers workshop. So we can do it by genre and text studies, and that's where we're looking at how those are organized and the criteria that makes them a narrative, an informational text, or an opinion, or an argument. Author studies, why do certain authors work right the way they do? We want to look at their purpose, the vocabulary and language structure, and the craft that's so important. And then we're going to think about our deeper level comprehension. We're going to keep them up here. Analyze, critique, evaluate, and synthesize. But look down here, grammar and language. It's okay. Some of that, to teach that in isolation and language workshop, sometimes we have to. Sometimes it can be tied to a mentor text, and I'm going to show you an example in a minute. But that is where you can teach some of that grammar that common core says you specifically have to teach. Okay, so let's look at, oh, we've got it on the wrong PowerPoint, but that's okay. I'm going to get to right here, and hopefully the rest of it's on here. I have two of these. This is one I presented in at a conference, but the way we're going to do this is we're going to look at the influences from Language Workshop, which is our complex text, grade level text or above, and going into Reader's Workshop, our instructional level text, or our grade level, or um, our grade level text. So, I've got several documents prepared for you. Oh, this is the right one. Yay. And I've selected an SLE that goes all the way across from kindergarten to fourth grade. And we're going to do some close analytical reading with Charlotte's Web. And we're going to do it by looking at the setting. And you wouldn't think that would be a very big deal. But in kindergarten, under key ideas and details, they have to be able to, with prompting and support, identify the setting, describe the setting in first grade, and it goes on up to use information gained from um, the reading to understand the setting. Then it goes all the way to describing the setting in depth and draw specific details within the text. And that's what we're going to do today. So we're going to start our time, and somebody put 407 down so we can see how fast this goes. But our lesson plan looks like this. We're going to determine the importance of a well-developed setting of a story, and we're going to look for three elements for the setting. We're going to look for place, time, environment, and then how that environment creates the mood for the story. And we're going to see, after reading um, a passage for Charlotte's Web, if E.B. White really developed a well-developed setting for our story of Charlotte's Web. So, today what you're going to need is a highlighter, a pencil,
you're going to need a, your passage that I did copy. I didn't want to borrow all the books in um, third grade of Charlotte's Web. It's entitled Escape, and it's probably on the back of the SLEs. And then you're going to need your story map, the blank side. And Debbie, I'm going to be looking to make sure yours is turned on the right side. <laughs> Simmons. <laughs> okay, so this is going to guide, our story map is going to guide the way that we look for our story elements because there are three parts to a well-developed setting. And we're going to look for key details or phrases in the passage that tell us where this particular setting takes place. This is the second setting in Charlotte's Web. Wilbur has gotten kicked out of Arable's farm. That was the first setting. And now he's in Suckerman. He got sold for $5. So we're going to look at how this setting creates a new environment for him and how the story might change. We're going to look for words and phrases about when, which would be the time, and then we're going to look for sensory details for our description. And this is where we want to look to see if the author has, well, has developed the setting so that it's put us right into the setting. We want to know how it feels to be there, what it smells like to be there, what it looks like we can visualize when we're there, what we might feel while we're there, and what we might touch. So as I read, what I would like you to do is I want you to be highlighting information that shows us parts of these parts of our setting. We're going to look for where, where, when, and then we're going to look for sensory details that describe the setting. So I am going to read to you as you highlight, and it's called Escape. The barn was very large. It was very old. It smelled of hay, and it smelled of manure. It smelled of perspiration, of tired horses, and the wonderful sweet breath of patient cows. It often had a sort of peaceful smell, as though nothing bad could ever happen again in the world. It smelled of grain and harness dressing and of axle grease and of rubber boots and of new rope. And whenever the cat was given a fish head to eat, the barn would smell of fish, but mostly it smelled of hay for there was always hay in the great loft of overhead. And there was always hay being pitched down to the cows and the horses and the sheep. The barn was pleasantly warm in winter when the animals spent most of their time indoors and it was pleasantly cool in summer when the big door stood wide open to the breeze. The barn had stalls on the main floor for the workhorses, tie-ups on the main floor for the cows, a sheepfold down below for the sheep, a pig pen down below for Wilbur, and it was full of all sorts of things that you find in barns. Ladders, grindstones, pitchforks, monkey wrenches, scythes, lawn mowers, snow shovels, axe handles, milk pails, water buckets, empty grain sacks, and rusty rat traps. It was the kind of barn that swallows like to build their nest in. It was the kind of barn that children like to play in, and the whole thing was owned by Fern's uncle, Homer L. Sutherman. Wilbur's new home was in the lower part of the barn, directly under the cows. Mr. Zuckerman knew that a manure pile is a good place to keep a young pig. Pigs need warmth, and it was warm and comfortable down there in the barn cellar on the south side. Fern came almost every day to visit him. She found an old milking stool that had been discarded, and she placed the stool in the sheepfold next to Wilbur's pen. Here she sat quietly during the long afternoons, thinking and listening and watching Wilbur. Okay, so now let's go back to our story map. And we're going to read, we're going to analyze 
us to see how well developed the setting was. And the first thing I'd like you to do is buzz at your table because I want you to come up with some phrases or words that describe where part two takes place. And you're just going to buzz for a few minutes. And when I put my hand up like this and say, give me five, everybody's going to come back and we're going to fill out our graphic organizer together. Okay, so buzz about the first part, where? Okay, give me five. Do we have a consensus at your tables about where part two takes place? I would like, I heard some good discussion over here on this side. I did. I heard some people really discussing where they thought this took place and evidence from the text. So, Michelle, would you tell me where your table thought this took place? Yes, ma'am. It took place in the very large, very old barn of Homer L. Zimmerman. Very large, very old barn. And later on in the passage, it said it belonged to Homer L. Yes, ma'am. Zuckerman. If you agree with that, thumbs up. Did anybody find any other keywords that I need to write or that you want to discuss? Who's in the lower part of the barn? Mm -hmm. Lower part of the barn. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I want you to buzz at your table and come up to come to consensus about where, or I'm sorry, when this takes place. This is the time element. It might be a season. It might be um, a time of the day, month. So think about it. Come up to consensus. And so it doesn't give us a time to subscribe, but it does say that she sat there during the long afternoon. And long afternoon, of course, it's here to point your background afternoon. Okay, give me five. I heard some good discussion. Thank you. You're a good student. Thank you. Modeling after the teacher. Um, heard some good discussion here. Laura, would you tell me what your table came to consensus with about when the story takes place? Um, well, at the very end of the story, it says here she sat quietly during the long afternoons. And we know that in the winter time, afternoons aren't very long because the, it, there's not a lot of daylight. So we figured that the long afternoon would mean that it would probably be during the summer because that's when our longest time comes. Oh, and I have some background knowledge about that. That's too. right. I am so proud of you. And actually, okay, help me. Help her. <laughs> there. Jesus. Yeah. Oh. Okay. You gotta get rid of that. Get rid of this. No, put the exit there. Oh, thank you. Okay. This is the first graphic organizer that we did on the first part of the story, if you'll remember. So, you're right. When this took place was the spring at Assel Ball sometime. I had to Google it. When do apple trees fall blossom? Late May. Well, what happens there is if you know that, 
then this is going to be five weeks later because five weeks he um, got kicked out of the farm at five weeks. He's seven weeks old now. So we can go back and infer. Okay, so if it was May, it's sad. Do I? Yeah. I love kids. Aren't kids helpful? <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> That's okay. That happened before you did So we're going to do the win and, and the long afternoons. And if we know that it's five weeks later after apple blossom time, bingo, what did you say, Laura? During the summer. During the summer. So we can infer now that it's summer because we can do the math. So very good. Okay. Now I want you to... Oh, anybody have anything else that we want to add? Key phrases or details about um, when the story takes place? All right. Talk a little bit about what sensory images you found that made you feel, see, hang on, just one second, thank you, about your sensory images, and look at your guide, your graphic organizer, to guide your thinking, and then um, we'll complete our graphic organizer. Okay, I'm going to add this. Well, I just think this is a great example because living on a farm. Okay, so you have a lot of background knowledge. I, background knowledge. I mean, I could just smell it, feel it. Oh, a smell of grain. Yeah. Grain, the apple grain. And the fish. Well, in the apple grain. I didn't find as much on the uh, feel, but I can connect my own background. Um, for some more, it takes me more. And then I don't know. There's not much. I think that's it. I bet it was. You could do this too of all the things that were said. But there's not much. There were tips that were tied to the food. Okay, give me five. <laughs> All right, let's just thank you. Popcorn out some answers. What are some things that made you or see that you were right in the middle of that barn? What were things that you could see? Cows. 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 The hay. Uh, Rusty rat traps. Rusty mm -hmm. rat traps. Rubber boots. Rubber boots. New rope. Thank you, Angie. Fish. All of the different tools that they listen to. Oh, milk pails. Milk pails. And to me, Kim, all that stuff together just kind of brought to me like a pleasant, purposeful clutter. Mm. Like it's clutter, but it had a use and that to me was comforting. It <coughs> put me into a odd thing is where it's supposed to be, but it's happy and comfy. It's an order. Yeah, okay. So when we start really talking about that mood, bring that back up because that's an important part of the setting. Very important. Okay, things that made you feel? The cool breeze. Cool breeze. Warm. Warm in winter. Warm in winter. The kind of barn that was warm in winter. But cool in the summer. But cool in summer. Perspiration. 
Oh, perspiration. <laughs> perspiration. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's go on to um, smell. I believe is the next one. It's blurry up here. Things you smell. Fish ass. Fish ass. Sweat. Sweet. Hey. Hey. Sweet breath of cow. Yes. Sweet <laughs> breath. They eat sweet, sweet breath. breath. <laughs> 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 Not just that. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can smell my dad's pants yeah. when I think of Axel Grease. Yeah, because they always smell like that. Oh, okay. Anything else? I also had a peaceful smell. Oh, peaceful smell. Hmm, I wonder what that smells like. Let's talk about that in just a minute. When we talk about mood. Things you can touch. Were there any, and they may not all be developed. Were there any words or phrases that were developed that we could touch? Okay. A question mark there. And here, you might have to infer here. I heard children laughing and the Ooh. Kids laughing. Kids said that kids like to play in the barns and the swallows build their nests. Swallows. And what do they do with that hay? They pitch the hay. Okay. So look at all of the sensory images that he created. Think about how he put this together as his setting for Wilbur's new home. And let's think about the mood that was created here. In the text, the author wrote, Zuckerman's barn had a peaceful smell. So what can we infer about the mood? How would it feel to be in this barn? Talk just for one minute at your table, and let's see how we're going to finish this. But you know, the, the cool thing thinking about this is that all the toy toy like the toys like this, they live on that old barn lot. <laughs> Well, it says that she sat quietly, thinking and listening. And she did that. I mean, she's just, 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 she's the text, the author wrote, Zuckerman's barn had a peaceful smell. And I added the sentence that Carrie said, there is order with the tools and the animals. So what are you thinking about the mood of this? How do you think that Fern feels? Safe and secure. Mm -hmm. Oh, Fern feels. How do you think Wilma feels? How do you think Wilma feels? Welcome. Comfortable. I still feel safe as well. Uh, it, 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 a place. It's, it was very specific where his place was, so he has a home. They feel safe. She is content to sit there and watch, and Wilbur is content to get to do pig things and be with all the other animals, and all the animals get along, and nobody's in, their, in his pig business. He's just a happy pig. So, do you think that E.B. White <laughs> made a well-developed setting for the story? The second part, the next one, is going to be when we go to the fair. That's the third setting of the story. So each time the setting changes, the mood changes, the descriptions change, and it's because we can, um, and it helps us to better understand. So here is your, um, and you did great. All the answers that I found, you guys found, and you guys found some more. So very good, thinking about the setting. But as we look at Language Workshop, oh, that's not really, I guess it is. Um, the last two slides 
were the lesson plans for what you could do to carry over for reader's, reader's workshop. And that was the end of the lesson at 4.22. So it wasn't, was it a 20 minute lesson? 4.27. Was it a 20 minute lesson about? So, but did you get deep into that passage and really closely analyze it? And wasn't that fun for the kids to be able to um, do that? and look for those things that are in Common Core that allow you to go deeper with the text because they're there. There are tons of it. There's only 10 reading for literature standards and 10 informational standards and they all relate together. And that's how we have to integrate them for our workshop. The next um, two slides, if you can read them, were how you can take language workshop and you can, or reading workshop and you can identify sensory images in a different mentor text that's a short read aloud and you can make an anchor chart with it and you can do the very same thing. And all I did was I looked and I can write like that and they suggested this as a mentor book. It's a beautiful book. It's never been read and it's back on our shelf and it's beautiful. I love it. Don't touch it. And then the next part to go on to writer's workshop is the very first sentence um, of Charlotte's Web and it's developing good leads. And the very first sentence, where's Papa going with that axe? Hmm. It's a question. I mean, that isn't. We started at the farm and Zuckerman got up, or uh, Papa got up and he's brushing his teeth. No, he got up, he got an ax, he had something to do. And the author put us right in the middle of it with that first lead sentence. So look at that, create an anchor chart, what kind of lead, there are different kinds of leads for writing, and that's a very I mean, it just draws me and it makes me want to read more. And that's what good authors do. So think about those complex texts and why you select them and what you can use Language Workshop for. Guys, the sky's the limit. All we have to do is think about how to integrate it and come up with those units of studies that lend themselves for good mentor, the use of good mentor texts and teach our kids to read like um, writers. And we're, we're going to be your great teachers. So let's support each other on that journey. Okay. okay. Thank you.